good evening. By chance, it was a near Anjan Gramatan. Give by chance, it was a PK at Mahanam. Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor Nalin Vikomarati. Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, Professor Ajit Diarvis. Professor Anurat Nijepal, staff members of the University of Morocco, and distinguished guests. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Don Anurat Sayanaka Vijaypal, on the occasion of his inaugural lecture as part of the lecture series of the Faculty of Graduate Studies of the University of Morocco. Anura, as is commonly known, graduated from the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Morocco 30 years ago. Anura was among the best in his back, and I was then pleased to recommend him for employment as a development engineer at the fledgling Lanka Transformers Limited, as I felt that to be a good teacher in electrical engineering, it was necessary to get first-hand experience working in an electrical engineering concern. Anura proved my faith in him and first rose to become the factory manager of Lanka Transformers Limited within one year. Then the government of Sri Lanka introduced a major policy shift in power sector by allowing private investment for power plants in the CEP system. Anura was taken off from the transformer factory and made the project manager to guide the formation of Lakhdanabe Limited just five years after graduation, which he then guided for the next four years. In 2001, LPL tied up with foreign companies to start Nivindu Private Limited to invest in hydropower generation. Anura was the obvious choice to develop its first project at Bellyhul Oya with the entire power construction handled by Sri Lankan engineers. He guided Nividu Private Limited as manager hydropower for the next five years till the middle of 2005 when he decided to get back into academia where he had been a visiting lecturer since graduation. In September 2005, Anura joined the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Morocco as a senior lecturer to impart his industrial knowledge to the young undergraduates and guide them in the correct path. He has been a chartered engineer in Sri Lanka since 1996, a corporate member of Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association since 2007, and a fellow of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka since 2009. He has also been recognized as an international professional engineer since 2008 and has had an extensive international training and experience in Bangladesh, China, Finland, Germany, India, Indonesia, Korea, Myanmar, Norway, Singapore, Switzerland, and USA. Even after he joined the academia, his services were in great demand from the industry. Among these are as vice chairman Elon Electric Board from 2011 to 2013, chairman National Engineering Research and Development Center from 2013 to 2014, chairman Elon Electric Board from 2015 to 2017, with parallel course of Director LTN Holdings Limited, Chairman Trinkamali Coal Power Company Limited, and Director Lanka Electric Company Private Limited. When he took his sabbatical leave from the University of Morocco from 2018 to 2020, he was invited and took over the reins as the Chief Executive Officer of Windforce Private Limited from June 2018 to February 2020. Anura has not only been active in industry, but has successfully supervised two students towards the Master of Philosophy degree, and over 35 students in the research component of the taught Master's degree program. He has published widely with publications in 18 peer-reviewed journals 
and 20 international and local corporate. He is also the author of three books on energy. He has been recognized by the University of Morocco for his outstanding research performance annually since 2016. I am pleased to present Professor Andrea Vijaypala to you for his inaugural lecture as a professor at the University of Morocco. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you very much, Professor, dear Professor Lucas, for your natural introduction of me. And uh, the fine details here are gone from the web, my way probably, and uh, even uh, surprised me because you have collected a lot of fine details as well. And once again, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, uh, dear Vice Chancellor, Professor Niranjit Muruvadana, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor PKS Mahanama, Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor Nalini Nukramarachi, Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, Professor Aditya Alvis, Head of Department of Electrical Engineering, Professor Udyan William Pan, Professor Rohan Lucas, Senior Professors, Professors, Senior Lecturers, Lecturers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I extend a warm welcome to all of you this afternoon. I wholeheartedly dedicate this inaugural lecture to my parents and teachers. Let me share my screen. I don't intend to say anything about myself because Professor Lucas has covered everything. So I don't want to say how, uh, how uh, my journey towards professorship at University of Morocco, it covered most of things. So I will save time on that. Uh, my speech will be on two parts. A brief recap on the reality of the economic crisis we are facing today. And then I will go on to present some selected nationally oriented research we have done at Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Morocco. Our economy is in great uh, trouble, as we all of you, us everyday witness. Our foreign reserves are at all time low levels. Rupee has devalued so much, we are expecting a high jump very soon when the government releases its control. GDP has plummeted. I am 57 years old. Samudrika, my wife, advises me not to mention age in public. But in my lifetime, I cannot recollect other than these great sports persons, any scholar or scientist who brought international fame or wealth that did our motherless justice for its old calling, Pearl of Indian Ocean. Today, the theme of my speech will be the need for aligning ourselves with the national economic growth. The topic I have selected today for my inaugural lecture is to help the country out of present economic precipice research with the national alignment. After serving the industry for 15 years, I have been with the University Academia for yet another 15 years. I have also been the chairman of National Engineering Research and Development Center for two years. At both places, I see a surprising low contribution to GDP through research and innovation. It is true that we make a lot of high level academic publications which provides us with many citations to be proud of. Can we equally be happy about the contributions our research brought to industry to develop products and services to generate economic value? I read from the banner uh, in this room on the wall of, uh, on the, my right side, quoting uh, Kumar uh, Tungamunidasa saying, Alut alut de notanana jatiya lo nonagi. The nation which does not produce innovative new products does not prosper. Is that not what exactly has happened to our nation today? We are in the worst economic crisis in the country. Country is facing for a good known period. We have a formidable loan portfolio to be repaid. 
we do not have enough foreign currency even by our day-to-day -day imports and neither capability of producing all relatives locally to fill the gaps. Electricity and energy sectors are in turmoil. Our food production and farming have not been at such low type probably for many centuries. I quote from Wikipedia. Vaminitya Femi, 103 to 89 BC. During the reigns of King Vattagamani Abaya was a period of over a decade in which ancient Sri Lanka's irrigation system failed as a result of invasion, corruption, and neglect. I repeat, as a result of invasion, corruption, and neglect, unquote. Now, whom we blame for all these? Probably them, and definitely now politicians. But who are politicians? They are also us, elected by us, failed to deliver to us, and now blamed by us. Us means we are also part of it. Therefore, we should do our duty to bring prosperity to this country, and that can be done only with the rapid economic development. This slide shows pre-COVID economic indicators of South Asian countries. It has been done in 2018. 2019 figures are projections. The economic growth rates are averages from 2013 to 2018. I selected this because it is after the end of the war and combining two government. It shows how deplorably bad we have been doing even pre-COVID. We are just about Afghanistan, because we know how the affairs are in Afghanistan. But see other countries, Pakistan, Bhutan, Maldives, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, they are doing far better than us. So this is how ADP projects economic growth rate for 2020 to 22 for South Asia. All these countries had COVID. See where they predict us to be at the very bottom. And I'm, I will not be surprised if we don't achieve even this much of 3.4% with the present power and energy crisis, which are affecting our industrial productions and other service sectors. Before going into the second part of my speech, let me present this interesting correlation between GDP growth rate and electricity demand uh, growth rate. This is uh, my sector. We are in the electricity sector, energy sector. And we can see from year 2000 to 2020, the GDP growth rate, which is in red, and the electricity demand growth rate, which is in uh, blue. And we can see the, the correlation. It acts in two ways. One thing is uh, due to incidents like war or which was in uh, extensively happening in 2009, the, the GDP and other things went down. Therefore, electricity demand went down. And it happened alternatively also when there is a power crisis. For example, in 2012-13, we had a severe power crisis with power cuts. See the electricity demand that is, electricity supply really came down, which forced the, the national economy to come down, economic growth rate, GDP growth rate to come down. And I'm sure this year it may have it may repeat again because of all these power cuts and energy supply shortages. Again, economic growth will come down. So it's unfortunate. But in the electricity sector, energy sector, we see the importance of our part. So we should provide cheap electricity and required reliability in order, in order to facilitate the economic growth rate. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I will stick to my talk proper this evening on the research and innovations done at Department of Electrical Engineering by me together with my students and colleagues. With my industrial background, I could recognize the problems as well as opportunities in the industry. And I try to find avenues and solutions together with my teams. I have picked those which can make a direct economic impact to the country. And in presenting them, I have avoided technical jargon so that any person can understand and appreciate them. So I have selected out of all the research and uh, uh, project work we have done at our department with my teams, 10 projects to be presented this evening on different electrical engineering supply aspects. 
The first one I have selected is co-firing of biomass with coal in pulverized coal-fired uh, boilers at Lapuja power plant. This I did with the engineer who is working at uh, the power plant, engineer Sarej Muzumpotua. He facilitated a lot because he has direct information about the, the power plant as well as its subsystem. So we, we plan to co-fire it with bio powdered biomass and then we studied what are the existing technologies. There are three technologies that we can use, direct, indirect and parallel. And after many uh, deliberations, we thought that direct combustion, direct co-firing will be the best option. And this is a, a, a typical polarized coal-fired boiler arrangement. We can see that uh, uh, the red color zone, firing zone, to which uh, polarized coal is uh, uh, mixed with uh, sent with uh, compressed air. So we plan to add powdered biomass to this uh, burners at the very point where the coal is entering. And we studied uh, different versions of biomass and because it has to be continuous supply and sustainably grown, we selected Glycidia, which is a famous biomass in Sri Lanka, fast growing and also uh, can be processed easily. And we compared with coal and found that it is very suitable to be added with coal to fire the boilers. And uh, we looked at the possibilities of transporting them in restrictions and cost implications. And we found that even if we transport in the furthest corners of Sri Lanka to Kutlam, it still makes economic sense. And then we looked at the, 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 the land requirement and other things. If you grow them as monocrops or intercrops, intercrops in coconut cultivations, for example, and found both can be applied, of course, uh, depending upon the opportunities for the, the suppliers. And as an example, as a start, we thought of replacing 5% of coal of Lakuya power plant, which means a requirement of 165,000 tons of biomass per year. At a 5 rupees per kilogram moderate price, this will translate to 825 million rupees, which will go to farmers and other rural economies because they will be the ones who will be supplying biomass. And uh, we can do it either with 16,500 uh, 16, acres of dedicated biomass plantation or 40,000 acres of intercrop or a combination of them. And we designed the system of processing and also we designed how and where the biomass should be added to the, the existing coal firing system. And uh, the black lines are the coal firing system, blue lines are what we proposed to bring compressed air, compressed uh, biomass with compressed air with the same pressure and add to the, the the coal lines and then they enter the furnace layer where the, 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 the flames are uh, converting the biomass and the coal together to heat energy. And the economic sensors, we worked out two and a half years, the exp expenditure requirement of 250 million would be easily covered. And uh, this is this makes more sense now because you can see these are the prices of, uh, price of coal from 2009 to 2022 uh, and the prices are in dollars per ton and you can see that since 2001 with the COVID implications and other supply demand mismatches, coal prices together with the other energy source prices have rocketed up. Earlier it used to be on average about $65 per ton. Now it has gone about $200 a ton. So I learned that recently Galapuji purchased about $200 a ton uh, coal prices. So I'm, I'm sure that but these prices, these high prices will, will not remain for a long time with the supply demand again readjusted, they will come down. But I'm also sure they will not come down to the previous low levels. They will stay above the previous low levels. So this makes a more economic sense. We made a publication in our research and also later, after two years of the research, I found that a UK utility takes next steps to convert coal units. I read the first line of this article. UK utility, Rex Power, last week said it has taken a fourth coal fired power generating unit offline at Rex Power Station in North Yorkshire in preparation to convert it to uh, run on biomass. Remember, it is not part mixing, it is complete uh, conversion to biomass. 
So if we make that, if we are able to do that, we can replace 2.5 million tons of coal a year, which will translate to even at uh, say, uh, uh, assuming $100 a ton, it will be say 250 million US dollars to our local economy, if we can retain that. So these are the challenges, challenges to be taken by both the government as well as the CEP, engineers, and uh, agriculture and everybody, the farming, energy plantations, and all these things. So if this is successful, after our T number of coconut plantations, energy plantations will come and strongly take over our, our uh, supporting our economy. The second project, the second research I want to present is development of a mathematical model to predict uh, daily demand of electricity based on weather parameters. So this I did with uh, my co-researchers, Dr. Tilak Siambalapidia and I.N. Jai Sekar, he's an uh, engineer from Sinon City Port. And uh, this load, load curve, I, this is the demand curve. This, of course, is a little old because uh, this is relevant to the period where we did the research. And, uh, but the shape remained the, almost the same. This is our daily demand curve. You can see early morning hours where the demand is very low. And then the morning, there's a peak. When we stir up in the morning, uh, putting our kettles and all these things on the network, and then day demand and a huge evening demand. The red curve corresponds to a dry day in the month of May 2013. And the black curve on the same month, in the same month, the on a wet day, both ways are working days. So days are working days. So similar, similar demand should exist. But we can see from a, from a wet day to dry day, there's a significant difference in the demand. So if the CEP system control engineer knows this is going to happen tomorrow, day after tomorrow, even afterwards, then he can plan this generation accordingly. If you put into the context of today, then he can plan his power cuts accordingly. So he can say on the say day after tomorrow, power cut set will be only three hours because it's going to be a cool day, uh, depending upon the weather. So that will be a handy uh, uh, prediction for them. And we we looked at how to how to predict this and then we looked at the available weather parameters because all these depend upon the weather parameters like temperature ambient temperature humidity wind direction uh, wind speed etc so we when we looked at there are plenty of predictions accurate predictions available to all these things three day uh, predictions five day predictions even 10 day predictions so we can easily use these parameters in in making a model so based on that, we try to make a model and we find that the weekdays are different from Saturdays and Saturdays are different from Sundays. So we have to build three models here, 24 equations for 24 hours of a weekday and similarly for Saturday and Sunday, which we did this way by multiple linear equation using these parameters. And this is the, the model that we built, a few equations of the model that we built for a working day, similarly for other days. And uh, so see, our this is the, the validation of our model. Validation of our model. You can see the black curve here is the actual demand. Actual demand of electricity on a certain day, February 3rd, 2014. Then we predicted date, say the green one, four days ahead. Four days ahead, green one. And then the blue one, light blue one, three days ahead prediction based on weather parameters. And uh, then the uh, purple one, two day ahead per prediction. And the red one, one day ahead prediction as you get, you get more and more accurate data. You can see almost all of them are pretty good enough for the same, for, for the utilization. So you can see even four day ahead prediction can be used handily by the system control engineer in, uh, in predicting the, the four days ahead demand. And accordingly, he can say to power plants, I don't want you on this day. We can manage without you take your your uh, say maintenance scheduled maintenance on that day, or else he can nowadays he can say this, uh, this day our demand is this therefore power cuts will be shorter or longer. So likewise, so this model will be useful to anybody uh, working in the system control center in managing the the, the dispatch main, the dispatch schedule. We made a publication on that also in the journal of uh, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Third one I want to present is optimization of the usage of thermal water resource for power generation. This I did with the engineer who was working with the 
uh, Mr. Engineer Patiraj, who was looking at Samalwa Power Station. We all know that this is a beautiful stair, uh, aerial view of Samalwa Power Plant, Samalwa Reservoir. And you can see, as we filled water in 1992, a leak developed about 53 meters below the surface water level. And uh, many efforts were uh, done to close it. And this shows the, the red, red line shows the leak rate in cubic meters per second, while the blue line shows the surface level, surf, uh, reservoir surface water level above mean sea level, which is on the right hand side, 400 meters plus and so on. And on the left hand side the scale, you can see uh, water the leak rate in cubic meters per second. And uh, first few years, for about, 19, about 1997, they tried their best to locate the leak and close it. They spent about 10, 15 billion rupees for a, a, a wall of uh, injected uh, grout to close it, where they think that the, the leak could exist, but it completely failed. Then in 1998-1999 period, they did a wet blanketing operation. This we know very well because the operation was carried out by the El Lanka Transformers Group. So that, that means we took uh, soil, suitable soil, and dumped into areas where the leak possibly existed. And it improved. You can see immediately afterwards, uh, uh, leak has reduced. Leak reduced by about to about say 60 percent of the previous value but unfortunately in 2007 after so many years of a low leak rate they thought that sorry for that i pressed the wrong button now. Yeah. Uh, they thought they can fill the reservoir a little more. And you can see that they tried to fill it and then the leak jumped up, red line jumped up and settled to a new value of about 2.5 cubic meters per second. Even today, the leak, leak is at that. So over the last 30 years, the, all the efforts to uh, close this leak has failed. Then we looked at the problem differently. So we brainstormed with my engineers my colleagues brainstormed and looked at how we can do otherwise to stop the this wastage of water. Then we considered this fact. The surface water level is about 440 meters above mean sea level. And the leak is at 387, about 53 meters below the surface level. Whereas the power plant, Samalaya power plant has a 320 meter head, that is 320 meters below 440 meter uh, surface water level. So that means, so we thought, why not pump back the water 53 meters and to every cubic meter so pumped back can go through the power plant with a 320 meter head. So it, had, it, 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 it looked at, looked to us uh, sensible. So we did the calculations. We designed the leak pump back, pump back system and then looked at how much energy is required to pump water back to the reservoir. So, but we can't pump back all the water. We have to let, uh, let the irrigation water flow through the Valerie River. So sub subtract in the, the, the minimum water requirement of the river. We decided to pump back the balance and for which we need 11.3 gigawatt hours. So 11.3 million units. And then the same water when runs to the power plant, as you can see in the, in the bottom there, can produce 59 or approximately 60 million units. So which means we can have an excess of 48 gigawatt hours if we do this. And uh, if we, now this is dispatchable in a bit, that is, you know, in the reservoir water. So we can dispatch them in the evening when the electricity generation is most costly. For example, GT7, which is serving the peak in the evening at Calnet is uh, cost about 40 rupees per kilowatt hour. So at this rate, if you calculate the, the value of this water, it translated about 1.9 billion rupees every year. And then we designed the leak pump, pump back system and found that the cost to be less than 1.5 billion rupees. So it is less than one year's uh, payback period. And so every year for a very long time to come, 
1.9 billion rupees, so nearly 2 billion rupees in today's energy terms will be available to CEP and to the nation. And we made a publication on this in, uh, I think it was in Merkon 2016. The fourth research out of the 10 uh, I am presenting this afternoon. Uh, the fourth one is mitigation of lightning surge stresses in the high voltage windings of distribution transformers by introducing an electrostatic shield. I did it the uh, uh, engineer HSC Karmananda. And you can see in the left bar chart, we can see that uh, the number of transformers failed in the uh, CB region 3. CB has four regions. This is region 3 data. And you can see the transformers failed due to a variety of reasons. So, but you can see when you look at April has a substantial increase in the fail failures. And it is due to, as we all know, the high uh, lightning and thunder. As we all know, April is a month, we get a lot of lightning and thunder. And so uh, these, uh, these additional failures are mostly attributable to failures by uh, lightning surges. Then we looked at the, uh, the, the, the right-hand side graph is very famous in our electricity theories. Professor Lucas used to teach us, Professor Sam Karunat used to teach us. And you can see that uh, there are three curves, how the surge wave, surge voltage will spread across the transformer winding from the line end to neutral end. And uh, you can see when this parameter called alpha is 10, on a few number of turns, large voltage quantity appears large voltage drop is there. But as, as alpha is zero, you can see for the voltage is more uniformly distributed. Therefore, the chance of initial turns getting failed, insulation failed is less. So we looked at how to apply this. We, we, we proposed an electrostatic shield between the last layer and the next layer. That is a, simply an aluminum foil to be connected to ground, to be connected to ground. And then we modeled the two circuits with and without the shield for a 160 kVA transformer with the data from Lanka Transformers Limited. And you can see the, the shield in the winding, uh, the black, uh, the, dark, the, uh, the black uh, layer. And accordingly, the, the, the CG and CF. I forgot to tell you, in this graph, this alpha is really square root of uh, capacitance to ground divided by capacitance to cap the heater winding turn by turn to turn capacitances per length. And so by decreasing capacitance to ground, we can decrease alpha or this parameter. And that is what we try to do. And uh, so by doing this, we simulated this and then found, you know, the bottom graph uh, shows the, the voltage distribution, surge voltage distribution along the transformer by high voltage winding without the shield which shows in 5% of the winding, about say 15, 20% of the voltage is distributed. Whereas when you have the, 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 the shield inserted, the above one, you can see a uh, very uniform distribution. Even at 10%, it is a very small quantity of surge voltage that will appear, that will prevent the turn to turn uh, insulation failure when the surge enters the the transformer winding. So we again made a publication on that. And then we discussed with Lanka transformers and they started to introduce this shield initially to private customers. It's still CEP has not accommodated. If CEP engineers are listening, I invite them to check this, look at the, the test data and to introduce this to your transformers as well, which will be immensely beneficial to you uh, in reducing the transformer failures. And for the private customers now, Lanka transformer has introduced this. So the aluminum shield appears just inside the last winding layer. So and it is grounded. So that's the idea. And the fifth research outcome I want to present is effects of electromagnetic fields due to high voltage transmission lines on detonator power in circuit. This came from a batchment of uh, of mine who works at GSMB, Geological Survey and Mines Bureau. They have a problem that you know that this is the way they rock blast and they uh, drill the rock and then insert the electric detonator at the bottom and then the gelignite charge and then cap it and then take the two wires and they connect many of them in series and with the dynamo 
they apply a voltage to blast it. That's the normal practice. Now they find when they do this under transmission lines, inadvertent firing takes place, endangering people's life. So they asked us, can you work out what are the safe distances from the transmission lines where we can do this operation safely? So we uh, simulated that, that, and we also did laboratory experiments, and then we did field testing. Of course, GSMB bought the necessary equipment for us. They are still with us, our, our laboratories. We, they donated to us. And then we did simulations and then came out with these safe distances. For example, 220 kV tra transmission lines, we said from the center line up to 40 meters, if you have your detonators, there is a 80% chance of inadvertent uh, firing. So we said avoid that and then you will be safe. So they are using this data in and they have given it to the industrial skills also in this business. But if you, if they really have to do under transmission lines, they have to construct a shield, shield and do it, then electromagnetic uh, penetration will not be there to fire the circuit, but that is an additional cost. We again made a uh, publication on that. The sixth uh, project that I want to present is technical, environmental and economic feasibility of introducing added storage to run of river main hydro plants to improve dis uh, dispatchability. And again, I come back to these load curves. Of course, I have put the load curve evolution also from uh, 2013 to 2020. It doesn't matter for my explanation, but we can see in the evening, there's a big peak. For that, you need dispatchable power plant. Dispatchable power plant means when the system control engineer tells via telephone call also that I want 100 megawatt megawatts of from your power plant from 6.30 p.m. to say 11.30 uh, p.m., then the power plant is able to do it. This can be done by large hydro power plants with reservoirs and also thermal power plant. But runoff river power plants, most of our mini hydro power plants with a total capacity of 400 megawatts are runoff river power plant, where if there is river water, water in the river, power plant can generate. Otherwise, it cannot generate. So they are not dispatchable. They are not dispatchable. Therefore, we investigated, can we make them dispatchable by collecting water, especially in the dry season like these days. So we uh, did this uh, two sample projects, Bulakwatta and uh, Batatota. One is in Hakutale, one is Kuruvite. Both belong, belongs to Winforce Private Limited. So I had connections with that, so I selected them. Then we designed a modification to the, uh, the beer to raise as much as possible the beer and collect water at the beer without you know having the back backwater curve increasing too much inundating upstream lands so here we proposed a 3.5 meter increase without much of an environmental impact and which could help this power plant to collect water without running all day collect water and run three hours three hours on full load during the evening or maybe three hours separately to during uh, morning peak, mid, uh, day peak or evening peak at, as appropriate. So we did all these designs and then we presented the paper also. And this is this concept is suited to upper Gothmali power plant. It has a small pond, 2.5 million cubic meter pond. So they collect water and run 150 megawatt, 55 megawatt full capacity in the evening, providing valuable peak power where the demand is highest. And we this is the publication we made in, I think, 2018, work uh, uh, on. And the seventh research I want to present is evaluation of the techno-economic benefits of shifting air conditioning loads from evening peak to off-peak covers as a case study for uh, cinnamon lake lakeside hotel. And this is, you know, uh, when we studied the hotel, this is their chillers electrical load profile. So it grows in the, say, in the evening, uh, say, from, say, 15 hours to about 18 hours, the maximum, and then also a high value. Uh, and in the morning hours, uh, low demand. And then we proposed, we proposed to, sorry, then I will refer to this, uh, the tariff, the tariff see, we apply some hotels, which I have marked with red pen. You can see, uh, hotels have a mandatory uh, time of day tariff. 
So during the daytime from 5.30 in the morning to 18.30, 14.65 rupees. Peak time, 18.30, 22.30, it is very expensive, 23.50. And off peak, very cheap, 9.80. We wanted to use this fact. Cheap, the, the electricity is cheap in the morning hours. So we proposed, we proposed, run the chillers more, the existing chiller more in the early morning hours when the electricity is very cheap and store, uh, store cold is water, cold storage, chilled water storage. And then don't run the chillers during the evening hours where the electricity is expensive from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Instead, use the stored chilled water, chilled water. We looked at many, many possibilities, but found this is the, the cheapest with the IRR of 40%. Other options were to have a separate chillers and all that, and also to use the daytime also replaced, but which didn't prove to be very attractive financially. So this is the best option. So we invite other hotels to also to use these facts and to invest a little. So this requires only 10 million uh, rupees. So you can see, we can get the long-term benefits for a hotel or other industry by employing this. Again, we made a publication based on this. The eighth research I want to uh, present is one I did when I was at Nerd Center together with the engineer India, Hemant Kumar. And what we planned is a micro turbine, micro electrical system, or without any grid connection, which has a, a generator, flowing turbine generator, and a PV panel and a battery and which can supply, we, we did it a pilot project with 100 watts, uh, uh, like a small case because we had a small wind turbine and we used a 60 watts uh, panel. This is for the, the demonstration only. And therefore, then we found that we can we use a home software from a National Renewable Energy Laboratory of USA for the optimization. And we came out with the 60 watts uh, panel, 60 watts panel, solar panel, and 100 watt turbine, this was available at Nerd Center. So we fixed that capacity and optimized the other two and saved 70 MP hour LED, uh, lead acid batteries, uh, four numbers as the support. So we can have a, uh, with a very high reliable micro power source for a uh, place where the grid is not available. So this can be scaled up at different costs, and but it is useful where the grid cannot extend and supply electricity. Again, we, we made the publication, and for that, we received the best paper award for the journal engineer in 2016. And uh, ninth research out of the 10 I am presenting is the, the economic comparison of reservoir type and runoff river type hydropower plants, a case study for Upper Kothmale uh, hydropower plant. You know that uh, reservoirs are not thought of as very environmental friendly due to a variety of reasons, because it stops water for the downstream, and the entire downstream ecological system is affected. And also, recently, the scientists found that uh, they are meeting, emitting sources because of the, the, the flooded plants in the initial case, and also the water, which, um, the, the plantation, the other things that flow into the reservoir. All these things decay and finally end up emitting methane into the environment. And that has a cost, greenhouse gas cost. So in comparing the two projects, the, the previous project was called Caledonia Reservoir Project, which was uh, going to have a, 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 a larger capacity uh, trans power plant, 214 megawatt power plant. But due to environmental reasons and uh, the protest on the politicians and the people, this was converted to a runoff river power plant and now executed and to be a 150 megawatt uh, power plant. And then we compared these two options, combined with the impacts of emission, we, we modeled and calculated how much methane it would uh, emit, and then costed that uh, about, say, $30 a ton and so on. And then, uh, uh, then we calculate the levelized cost of electricity, which is in the bottom most slide for the two power plants, and found that for the reservoir Caledonia project, it is for the same year's cost, uh, 1538 rupees, whereas the uh, Talwakale Reservoir ROR project is only 11.17 unit cost. So comparatively, therefore, uh, reservoir type projects are also good. Only disadvantage is we lose some capacity, 240 megawatt 
against 150 megawatt and also dispatchability is limited but unit cost wise the run of new power plant seems to be more attractive and again we made the publication and for which also we received the best paper award for the journal in 2018 and the last project i want to present is the automatic load balancer for distribution transformers this we did as an undergraduate project uh, professor jp karunadasan myself and the engineer from ceb uh, engineer fernando uh, uh, supervised this project and of course this is a combined project engineer fernando did the master's project with this with simulation but with undergraduate project we did the, the physical construction part and uh, this is the problem you know that when you take a distribution transformer it is impossible to balance the three phase current a distribution transformer on your road site has three phases so three phases carry uh, currents so here we have termed them uh, ia ib and ic you can see in this case ic is pretty high pretty high compared to other so so we can't utilize the transformer fully one phase get fully overloaded before other phases and what ceb and leco do is uh, say periodically every six months or yearly they will try to shift the load so houses from the highly loaded phase to a low uh, loaded phase but this is a never 100 percent successful task one thing is the loads that customer loads vary and also nowadays it is more aggravated by the presence of solar photovoltaic generation on rooftops so it is not possible to do uh, manually in a perfect so what we proposed is to you know the source is the transformer we want to keep the three currents in the transformer equal that is our target so what we thought is but the load currents can be different load currents can be high medium or low so what we thought is rather than coming to the source to supply currents to the the inverter system that we designed or the automatic load balancer to the highly high load required phases and to draw currents from the low uh, load low, uh, the, the phases low current phases to our system and then have a dc common bar from which to invert them to ac and to feed the necessary phases and we our students constructed this uh, uh, unit the inverter systems and this automatic load balancer and demonstrated and this is the outcome you can see the topmost one before balancing you can see the purple phase has the higher current green one and red one lower but all different then you can see the second one from, from top you can see after few cycles our automatic load balancer balances all three phases which will make which will facilitate ceb to utilize the full capacity or they could utilize the full capacity of the transformer without any any violation of the the loading conditions of the phases and this was published in Sri Lanka Power Engineering Conference 2021. And out, out of all the undergraduate projects that were, that were presented there, this won the first place in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have presented 10 cases to you. And then uh, I have disseminated my knowledge with uh, uh, what I have gained in the industry as well as in academia by writing a book on rooftop solar PV systems which include the financial analysis. So if you really want to look at whether the investment is worthwhile, there's a chapter how to do an economic analysis of your investment. And then I have also shared my knowledge with the hydropower industry by writing the book called Development of Small Hydropower Plants, Practical Information, which I later translated to Singhala because there are a large number of uh, people working in a small hydro sector who are not very conversant with uh, English. So this single version is also in high demand. Many people have used it. And many engineers have commented to me that they have been designed uh, hydropower plants. They refer to my books. So I'm very happy on that. And I have also disseminated my knowledge in participating in more than 25 TV debates, discussions, and interviews where I have shared my views on power sector and uh, what should be done, what should not be done, etc. And I would also like to recollect as the then president of the University of University of Moratua Teachers Association, that we supported the introduction of the research allowance in 2012 while engaged in the several months-long trade union actions. Union, some, some other universities I will not name uh, were totally against 
in connecting the performance to salary, but we insisted it should be there. When we look back over the past 10 years, from 2012 to, uh, 12 to 2022, we see a marked increase in the number of research publications in all universities. All of us can be happy about it. To get the research allowance, we have to have at least one acceptable publication. A professor is paid nearly half a million rupees as research allowance every year. It is a pretty big amount. Now I would like to further propose, with, if our Deputy Vice Chancellor is listening, uh, who is the chairman of the committee approving the research allowance, uh, allowance, to include a new condition to say that the research publication should be in one way or the other contributing to the national development. This is, of course, more than justifiable as our salaries are paid out of the consolidated funds and finally sponsored by the people of the for people of uh, this country. With this, I would like to present my last slide, which shows the mentors and the supporters of my life, my grandmother, my parents and teachers, and in the university, Professor Sam Karunathan, Professor GTF De Silva, and Professor uh, Lucas, of course. And then after graduation, uh, engineer Yudi Javartan, who was my first boss, and also he was my last boss because I stayed with him for 15 years. And then professor, uh, late Professor H.I.R. Perra, who was the head of the department, who recruited me into this department, and also until his demise, he was my best friend. And also uh, Professor Keke by W. Perra has been my teacher, as well as my uh, mentor, and also always sharing our views as we worked in the industry and also in the ministry, in many teams and uh, under various ministers that uh, okay, working together. And Professor Lucas has been in the entire cross pro section, even up before the, in the university, as well as after graduation. Uh, with that, let me uh, conclude my presentation this evening. Dear Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you profoundly for spending your valuable time to listen to me this afternoon. Good evening, good night. Take care during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 10 projects of national relevance, and how many of that 10 have been actually been integrated? Some of them, yes. I asked the CV people to listen to <laughs> Right, maybe we should tell that we had to run the generator um, in anticipation of the event that you're running the journey. Um, because otherwise, we, you never know uh, the power cuts coming now. Um, so it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Ali, Dean of Faculty of Engineering, and uh, the program of the session to mentor to uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anurag Jepal. Uh, one, uh, one thing that uh, came to my mind uh, while listening to Professor Anurag, uh, one of the uh, major criticism leveled against uh, university research is that uh, they are not nationally relevant and they do not contribute to the uh, nation while uh, research is done for the sake of research and without any relevance but today we uh, heard and learned from uh, professor anurad uh, many research that are actually solutions to existing industrial problems all of them are uh, what uh, the problems that uh, Sri Lankan industry faces and not only um, he has solved some of them have been already uh, utilized in the industry so congratulations and thank you very much and uh, we have a little as usual a little momento thank you very much With that, another inaugural lecture comes to a close and uh, till we meet again next month. Thank you and have a good day.